Hey guys, it's Mr. Whitley, and today's lesson is for Wednesday the 6th. Um, as you can see, we've moved to a different location, um, and we're going to jump right into it. So, we're doing some reviewing for skills that we've worked on in foundations since the beginning of the year. And behind me, probably hear Mando squeaking on his squeaky toy, so we'll try and ignore that. So, up here, three of the things that we hit at the beginning of the year this year were the k sounds. The three ways that we can make the k sounds. And those are C, K, and CK, okay? Now, there's some tricks to this, especially when we use these um, these sounds and at the end of a word. So for the CK, if we look up here, we use the CK at the end of the word after it comes after a short vowel. So like sock. So we hear s, ah, and then we're going to put our two fingers together. Got to put those two sounds together. K, s, ah, Sock. It's a short O sound. Um, and because it's a short O sound and the K sound comes right after it, we're going to use CK. So, sock. One scoop, close syllable, mark it off. Our CK comes right after that short vowel. Well, we don't always use a CK at the end of a word. Sometimes we need to use a K. And the K exception happens at the opposite of when we'd use a CK. So for a CK, we would use it after, directly after a short vowel. So directly means right after a short vowel. Now, if you have a word and you have the K sound and it doesn't happen right after. So see how there's the O there, and it makes a short O sound, and right after the O, there's the CK. Over here, for milk, we have M, E, U, K. We have the N, we have that short I, we have the L after it, and that's the key part. We still have a short vowel, but since there's an L right after the short vowel, then we'd use a K. If it was just M-I, and we didn't have an L, and we heard a K sound at the end, then we'd use a CK. But since there's a letter between that short vowel and that K sound, that's when we use the K. So just remember, if there's a short vowel sound and the K sound happens right after the a uh, short vowel sound, that's when you use a CK. And if there's a short vowel sound, but there's something after that short vowel sound, and then you have a K sound, a K sound, then we use a K. Mando, did you lose your ball again? Oh my goodness, give me a second. How did you lose your ball again? Okay, go get it. Mando has a habit of losing his, his squeaky ball under the futon, and he'll sit there and look at me until I go get it. Okay, so fractions. So the stuff that I'm really excited about teaching you guys. So we hit some of these yesterday. Now we talked about the fact that fractions are all about being fair and equal. If the pieces aren't the same size, it won't work. Mando's gonna knock over my camera. Buddy, hold on. Go get it. <laughs> All about being fair and equal. So our, our pieces that we split the fractions up into have to be the exact same size, no matter what. Otherwise, it's not a true fraction, okay? So here we're gonna look at three different types of fractions, three different um, amounts. We have thirds, we have halves, and we have fourths. So if we're talking about thirds, obviously you can say, all right, I see the word three in there. So we're gonna split this thing into three equal parts. Now, I'm gonna show you a couple of ways. I want you to tell me if this one's right or not. 
So if I do it like this, one, two, three, I have three pieces. That's thirds, right? Well, at home, you should be shaking your head no. Because if you look at this piece compared to this piece, they're not equal. They're not the same. If this was your piece and you're giving it to your brother, he'd be having a fit right now. So, that is not a true third. We have to have the pieces be the same and equal. Okay, for thirds, here's a trick. If you're doing it, you can always make like a peace sign. Ugh, Mr. Willie's thirds are always terrible. I may have to make that a little wider. There we go. That's about as good as I can draw it. But in this case, there are three pieces. They're kind of equal as far as my drawing. They're about as close as they can get. But three equal pieces makes it thirds. Now you can make thirds in our square, in our rectangle um, as well, uh, but circle is always a good one to learn on because it's a little tricky actually. So three equal pieces in fractions is called thirds. Now if you had a cake and you cut it into thirds and you ate one of those pieces, we would say that you ate one third, and that's how you'd write it. The top is the piece that you ate or cut out. That's your numerator. And at the bottom is the total amount of pieces you had at the beginning. That's your denominator. So numerator, denominator, halves. This one you can do so many ways. You can do it like this. You can do it like this. You can even do it, my favorite way is doing it like this. As long as the pieces are equal and we have the same amount, you're good. Halves. So imagine that you cut your cake into two pieces and you ate one of them, so you fill in one of them. That's one half or halves. One out of two, you ate one piece out of two. Your numerator is one, your denominator is two. Your part and your total. Force, you can do a lot of different ways, um, but I'm just gonna do it this way. I'm gonna do my line down the middle. I'm gonna do a line down here. Okay, so that's force, four equal pieces. We fill in one, you ate one piece out of four. We would say that you ate one fourth. One piece out of the four that you cut, you ate. So it's one fourth. I love fractions. They're always fun to teach. Okay, we're going to jump into our digestive system book. This one's a longer one. I'm trying to break it up just so it's not too long. This one's pretty interesting. The part we're going to hit probably Thursday, maybe next Monday, is... Um, is an interesting one. It's all about getting sick. So, don't drink this juice. Your stomach is made up of strong muscles. It can stretch out to hold about three pints of food at one time. I've been told that if you take your fist and, and hold it up, that's about the size of your, your stomach. When food enters your stomach, the muscles squeeze and mash your food into smaller and smaller pieces. The cell lining in your stomach release a liquid called gastric juice. It creates enzymes and hydrochloric acid. This acid is strong enough to dissolve metal. Oh my goodness, if we go back to the beginning, whether we had true or false questions, which one's true? Your small intestine is about five feet long. And acid is strong enough to dissolve metal, helps digest food in the stomach. Well, we know that acid is strong enough to digest metal, so that's true. Um, let's see, sorry. Uh, a mucus lining, and mucus is like kind of like snot, uh, lining protects your stomach from the acid. Gastric juice begins to break down proteins. Proteins are found in foods such as meat, cheese, and eggs. Food stays in your stomach for about two to five hours. So try not to eat too late. Otherwise, this is going to sit in your stomach at night. Once it mixes with the gastric juice, it is called chyme. 
The stomach releases chyme into the duodenum, and this is the first part of the small intestine. A, a muscle called a sphincter relaxes a little to let chyme pass through. The sphincter then squeezes tightly to keep the rest in your stomach. So, how does the stomach digest food? It says it takes five seconds for a piece of solid food to re reach the stomach. Food enters the stomach, gastric juices break down, proteins, the stomach walls contract, it means kind of squeezing. The digested food turns into chyme. The sphincter uh, opens to let a small amount of chyme pass. So it kind of like, it's like it's squeezing out, almost like when we did our, um, our uh, puffy paint art on Friday where we had the, the bag and we squeezed a little out at once. It's small, but it's long. The small intestine is where most food leaves your digestive tract and enters your bloodstream. Before this happens, the food is broken down even further. Further, Organs such as your pancreas, gallbladder, and liver help this digestion happen. Hold on. Mando lost this thing again, and he's going to destroy my chair. So, What are you doing? Get your ball, my friend. Go get it. It's over there. Your pancreas squirts fluid into the doldedrum. This fluid is rich in enzymes that break down fats, proteins, and starches. The fluid also contains a chemical that makes chyme less, ex less acidic. It's called sodium bicarbonate. Oh my goodness. Your gallbladder adds a liquid called bile to the chyme. Bile helps break up blobs of fat so that enzymes can get it to it more easily. Bile is made in the liver. It's stored in the gallbladder. Bile is not very fun. If you get really sick and you throw up a lot, sometimes you throw up bile and it really ugh, tastes awful. The small intestine has many folds. It is lined with millions of finger-shaped bumps called villi. This creates a huge surface area that can absorb vo large volumes of food quickly. Tiny blood vessels inside the villi <clears throat> absorb the nutrients straight into your bloodstream. Nutrient-rich blood goes from your small intestine to your liver. The liver converts, that means changes over, the nutrients into substances needed by the body. It stores some nutrients. It releases them into the blood when they are needed. The liver also breaks down harmful substances such as alcohol. The interesting thing is, if a surgeon accidentally cut off a piece of your liver, it would grow back. It's crazy. The end of the line... By the time the food reaches the end of the small intestine, most of the nutrients have been absorbed. The parts that your body can't pass in, uh, into your large intestine. This intestine is only five feet long. However, it's four to five inches wide. The large intestine is also called the colon. It absorbs minerals and water from indigestible food. This makes the waste more solid. Lumps of solid waste are called feces. Muscles push the feces along the colon to the rectum. They remain there until you go to the bathroom. So you poop out your waste is essentially what it is, okay? So here's some digestive tips. Eat at regular meal time, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Chew your food well. Don't like swell whole like a python. Stop eating before you feel really full. The brain signals a feeling of fullness about 10 minutes after you're actually full. Relax. If you're relaxed, your body will produce more gastric juice. Sit up straight when you eat so your digestive tract is not cramped, so don't, don't lean over on a couch. Avoid drinking lots of liquids half an hour before or after your meals. And don't eat late at night. It takes your body longer to digest food when you are asleep. All right, my friends. We will talk more tomorrow, and I will, uh, I will see you then. Okay? Bye.